Hello, developers. Hi. 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 Oh my god, you guys are so excited for church day at three. I don't know if I'm going to manage that amount of energy. We'll see. Um, yeah, so I'm Emily. Uh, I work at Google. And today I'll be talking about not Google things. Um, I'm going to talk about HashiCorp Vault uh, and using it with Chef. Uh, so I'm going to assume everyone here already knows how to use Chef and is using it. But how many people here use Vault or are currently thinking about using Vault? Ooh, lots of hands went up. <laughs> so exciting. Uh, so this talk will kind of, it's, it'll be a high level introduction. So if you're already using Vault, you might be disappointed. <laughs> um, a quick disclaimer, you might notice that neither of these products are from Google, so why am I here? I don't even use Chef at Google that much. Um, so this talk was actually supposed to be given by my coworker, Seth Spargo, uh, who has worked at both HashiCorp and Chef. Um, I am not Seth Spargo, uh, <laughs> but uh, he involunteered me to give this talk instead. Um, so what I do at Google is I mostly work on open source tools and working on integrating them with GCP. So I've actually done a lot of work for Vault, and I've done some stuff with Chef, but yeah. So here I am. <laughs> uh, he described this talk as a demo-driven journey, but I think he wrote that before he knew how long the talk was, so it's half true. Um, I only have 20 minutes, so part of it will not be demos. Sorry if that disappointed you. Anyways, um, disclaimer. So. I'll be talking a lot about GCP integrations just because A, that's what I've worked on and I'm proud of it and I want to show it off, but B, my team pays for my billing so I can bill my team for my demo. <laughs> Anyways, um, so this will be more of like using HashiCorp Vault with Chef and GCP. Cool. Uh, so before we get started talking about what either of these things are, uh, let's talk about what's a secret. So the formal definition of a secret is anything which, if acquired by an unauthorized party, could cause reputational, monetary, or physical harm to an organization or a person. Uh, what does this mean for you personally? Usually this is things like passwords, social security numbers, credit cards, very normal secret things. Um, but what about emails or uh, phone numbers? Right? For you, it might not be that important. You can just hand it out to get 10% off at whatever website you go to. But what about the president, right? His email might be a little more uh, of a secret than yours. Uh, but let's say you create a joke cryptocurrency, jokingly name it after yourself, um, but suddenly Emily Coin blows up <laughs> and everyone is buying it. How fast do you think someone could find your address? Um, are some of you regretting giving your address to Baskin Robbins for a free scoop of ice cream? <laughs> so. What does this mean for your organization? Uh, what kind of secrets do you need to protect for your org? Uh, do you, what credentials do your developers need um, or your apps need and for how long? Um, as Ben Franklin said, three may keep a secret if two of them are dead. In less dramatic words, the longer you need a secret, uh, the more likely it is to be compromised. So you can make your developers rotate their, to their passwords or tokens or your keys, and ideally your credentials shouldn't last forever. Uh, or you can just take it out of their hands by using temporary credentials overall. So when you're thinking about protecting your secrets on an organization level, it's important to get developers using the proper management workflow before things go bad. What should you be considering? Um, the most important question, of course, is how complicated is it to obtain secrets? Simple solutions provide less protection, but if you make it too hard, your developers will get really loud and complain. Um, or even worse, go around your airtight security practices in very bad, very quiet ways. Uh, you need to find the right balance of different solutions with different trade-offs. What sh should you be thinking about? First, how quickly and easy is it to generate new secrets, rotate or revoke secrets? If you're using Chef, you probably care about automating your workflow, but how much human work do you need to generate new credentials? Uh, are you generating an encryption key by hand using OpenSSL that you found on Stack Overflow and passing it around in a sad text file? If someone leaves, how much work do you have to do to rotate that key? Does everyone use that key and now you have to take away all of theirs? Or maybe you're just like, whatever, everyone can still use it. Hopefully they didn't save a copy. Uh, what can you assign different access levels? 
So for example, dev or prod, or can you assign per node or per user secrets? Um, if you can do that, the scope of secrets that you need to change when you do things like uh, revocation or rotation uh, is greatly s reduced. Um, do you have logs of who used a specific secret? If a secret gets stolen, do you know who stole it uh, or who actually had uh, access to that secret at any time? And finally, are your secrets locked to specific tools or platforms? A lot of secret management tools uh, tend to be locked to something like uh, GCP or AWS or on the other hand, Chef, right? And so how many places do you need to duplicate your secrets? And how many copies of that secret exist in the world at a given time? Ideally for some of you, the answers to these questions are, we don't care about that, uh, so we're not doing it, and that's why we're not doing it. Um, and that's probably fine. Uh, the takeaway from this talk shouldn't be, you need to use HashiCorp Vault now or else. Um, instead, uh, I want to introduce HashiCorp Vault as an extremely powerful tool for secrets management. Uh, but if you don't need all the f features it offers, it may not make sense for you to change your current secrets management workflow. Uh, so instead, I want you to know what problems Vault solves and what are the trade-offs between Vault and your current approach in solving these problems. Uh, so in order to do that, let's talk about what are you doing in Chef right now? <coughs> so the first extremely simple answer is you just save it <laughs> in plain text. Um, you've probably checked code like this into source control at some point and you're like, it's just temporary, but it's been like a year or like five. <laughs> uh, advantages are very, very clear. It's simple and you can put it into source control and everyone knows what it is, even if it's being used by everything. The disadvantages though are also clear. Anyone with access to your repo have access um, and you're kind of just trusting the SEM gods to not screw with you. Um, yeah. So what can you do better? Um, well, maybe you're thinking node attributes. So the advantages are they can be per node, so not just out to everyone, and they can be surrounded by ACL. On the other hand, they're still plain text, and um, they're persisted as plain text back to your chef server. And so that actually might be more confusing as well than source control because you don't really know which nodes actually have which credentials and you kind of have to go investigate and figure that out. And so you might end up making your uh, workflow less secure than actually just in plain text source code. So I think a more common pattern for people who actually are thinking about secrets and things like that uh, are encrypted data bags um, where you can see a command to create it, where you create your own key, and then uh, you use Knife to create an <coughs> encrypted data bag. And then you could see an uh, example recipe where that is being used. The advantages are the data is actually encrypted, so even if the secrets are exposed, or if you want to just put it into source control, it doesn't mean that exposing that will actually expose the secrets. Um, you can do things like per node secrets or per user secrets. Um, but the disadvantages are it requires a single shared symmetric key uh, to be shared across all the nodes. And once you're sharing that key across all the nodes, all of them have access to that secret no matter what. And so rotating one node, for example, means you have to rotate all of them. Also, a human still needs to actually generate the key and encrypt the data bag itself, which means you have uh, human interaction. Finally, auditing is very hard because all of the nodes uh, interact through the same API. Um, a related tool is Chef Vault, not HashiCorp Vault. Um, this is very confusing. Who knew Vault was so useful in security terms? Um, it was transferred to Chef in 2015, I think. Um, and it was originally by Nordstrom Chef Ike. I don't know actually what the term is. <laughs> um, it's built on, in top, on top of encrypted data bags where it handles uh, the key distribution for you. So in that case, it's still better, but it still requires human interaction to add new nodes. And so it doesn't really work for auto healing or things like that. Um, and auditing is still not great. So what can we do better? Now, as I mentioned, none of these are inherently wrong. Well, maybe a few of them. 
but there are definitely some areas we could do better. Um, for example, avoid storing secrets in plain text or using only ACLs. Um, in general, most of these uh, approaches have only one system needs to be co compromised to actually get the secrets, and usually these secrets last forever. Uh, so once they have it, it's only until you realize and you know try to go back and revoke secrets that it actually um, gets removed. Um, there's no auditing, so if something does get stolen or you know there's just a bug and it exposes something, you don't really know um, who actually got the secret or things like that. Um, and there's a lot of manual work involved. So we all love automated workflows. Um, if you were saying from the previous talk, everyone loves Kubernetes. Uh, and so a lot of these require manual intervention to push out new secrets or start the rotation process, things like that. And most of the secrets you generate actually start out as user-generated secrets. So if a, there's a way to remove that so that when you rotate secrets, you don't actually have to like go and type something, that's much better. So HashiCorp Vault was actually designed to address many of these problems. And so in the rest of the talk, I'll show how Vault does secrets management and then demo how it works and then how you can, you can integrate it into your Chef workflow. So as an overview of Chef, or Vault, uh, HashiCorp Vault is an open source user managed server application. Uh, it allows you to provide a single source of truth uh, for secrets and credential management within an organization. Um, it's often referred to as secrets as a service. Um, it allows both pr programmatic access for your machines and operator access for your human developers. Uh, the entire system is controlled via fine-grained ACLs and <coughs> policies to grant particular users, groups, or machines access to information in a vault. Um, and it handles both long-lived secrets and leasing secrets um, where you can lease secrets and they have a TTL um, and so you can renew these secrets, revoke them and Vault will automatically do that if you don't intervene at all either. Um, it also allows for things like encryption as a service or generating dynamic credentials which we'll talk about a little more. Um, but first let's look a little more in depth at how Vault is designed. So the majority of ser the server runs within memory and any data that must be durably saved or exposed outside what's called the barrier is encrypted. So any incoming requests by admins to save secrets to Vault or users to fetch secrets are done through the HTTP API, uh, secured by TLS. Any durable data is encrypted before being saved to storage by a base encryption key that is never exposed outside the Vault. Um, and as you can see, several of the components are referred to as backends. These are pluggable components, allowing for integrations with pretty much any third-party identity you could need or credential service you could need. Um, you can see most user requests are routed um, through the pass routing to one of three backends. The system is sort of just like metadata about the server, um, but more interesting are the credential or auth backends and secret backends. So let's first talk about the auth backends. Uh, before a user can access or write secrets to the server, uh, they must first actually be authenticated to the server, and this is sort of where our fine-grained ACL or policy stuff comes in. Um, the credential or auth backends actually handle this authentication uh, and return an auth token with associated policies that dictate what paths or secrets, essentially, a user can access. All requests through the API that aren't requesting an auth token must have an auth token in the header. Um, as mentioned, because these are plugins, you can use pretty much any third-party identity. Um, developers might choose to use things like LDAP or GitHub, but uh, Vault also allows programmatic access for machines. Um, as an example, last year I wrote an auth plugin for authenticating GCP compute engine VMs. Uh, so let's take a look at how that works. So as a quick overview, um, essentially, each GC VM has a metadata token associated with it. Uh, you don't need additional credentials to access it from a GC VM, so as soon as it starts up, you can grab it from the metadata server, um, send it to Vault. Vault verifies it with Google, because it's a Google signed uh, JWT token, and uh, if it's valid, it'll return everything that's great, and Vault will return an auth token. 
And so then you can have your VMs access your secrets without needing actual additional credentials, which is really useful for things like automated workflows where you're spinning up VMs and you don't really want to go in and intervene and put in like credential files or things like that. Um, so now that we can actually authenticate to Vault, uh, let's actually look at how we obtain secrets from Vault. So the secrets backends uh, handle the majority of Vault operations, and they primarily deal with two types of secrets. So the built-in one uh, handles what are called static secrets, and essentially act as encrypted KV store. Uh, kind of like encrypted Redis. Um, these are typically long-lasting. Uh, the dynamic credentials, on the other hand, actually deal with, uh, or the other secrets are dynamic secrets, which are fairly unique to Vault. Uh, these are generally short-lived credentials that can be built on top of short-term or infinite lifetime credentials for many third-party identities. Um, it's useful because secrets with longer lifetimes are generally more vulnerable to being compromised, so Vault automatically assigns leases to these secrets and will revoke them automatically. So you don't actually have to think about giving temporary credentials out. Vault offers many such backends. Um, for example, the database backend allows you to generate arbitrary short-lived database credentials, or the PKI backend allows you to generate dynamic certs. Um, I'll be demoing the GCP secrets backend. So this diagram is mostly for reference since I don't really have time to go through it, but I'm gonna switch to my demo now. Um, let's see. So, oh, that's lovely. Why can't I move past this? I don't know why my mouse was doing that, but we'll see. I'm not really sure why it won't let me select anything past this point on my screen, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and run the demo. So uh, as you can see, I already have a Vault server kind of set up. Um, yeah, give me one second. There we go, cool. Is that good? There we go. <laughs> cool, so I'm gonna go back and forth between uh, my kind of scripts because I will forget otherwise what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so first I'll show you two requests just to like a static secret. Um, so, uh, this is the KV backend. So essentially the first one is missing a client token or an auth token as I mentioned. Um, and so the second one, uh, you can see I've added the token in, um, which is saved to this file and the request is authorized now. So let's actually look at the auth backend. So I'm just gonna run all of these at once for brevity. <laughs> um, but. Uh, the first one is my role set, uh, which basically determines what policies I uh, assign to credentials generated through the GCP secrets backend. Um, here, I then read a credential and it gives me an OAuth token. And so if you see, if I run it again, it's an actually different OAuth, OAuth token. Oh. Mm. It might not be working. Um, 
but so in this case, um, then if we run a request to storage, um, it'll show my storage file that I've saved in this bucket. And so you can then um, take this uh, token and then kind of just ignore it and Vault will re revoke it once it's up. Um, this is an OF token, so it has a lifetime of an hour. I'm running very over, I realize, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, to kind of skip ahead, So if we go back uh, to the vault architecture, um, actually I'm gonna skip a little more just cause it's we're running out of time. But um, the encryption key that we mentioned is um, protected uh, as, as an additional level of security. Um, each key is split into a number of key shares and so you need a certain number to actually uh, reconstruct the encryption key. Um, and so that sort of makes it so an attacker doesn't need as many keys uh, in order to, uh, uh, or attacker needs more keys or credentials to actually access a vault um, if it's being uh, attacked. So I'll quickly just demo um, my chef recipes that I wrote. Um, so essentially they'll access um, vault through chef. Okay. So um, So this one essentially just reads from the KV backend and uh, writes it out to a credentials file. Um, and as you can see, it uses remote file to access uh, the vault server. So if we go ahead and do that. Um, oh, well, it looks like my demo is not working right now, which is okay, because I'm out of time. But uh, if <laughs> you have any questions, feel free to come in and ask me. Um, yeah.